Hi everyone, welcome back. Um, my name is Tom Saunders and I'm Head of Public Engagement at UK Research and Innovation. Um, yeah, just, just to say thanks everyone for joining today. I think it's, it's a really fascinating event and uh, I'm, I'm learning lots. Um, now we have a, a keynote speech from Dr. Mark Kutchner, Kutchner and I'm, I'm really excited about this because uh, we sort of look to uh, NASA and their work as a sort of inspiration for our own work on, on, on citizen science. Um, Mark is a citizen science officer um, for uh, NASA's science mission directorate and, and um, Mark will talk to you all about this, but um, uh, the projects that they run uh, engage millions uh, in citizen science. And so um, uh, I won't say much more, but but yeah, I'm really looking forward to this talk. And then I'll um, I'll chair a, a question and answer session afterwards. So um, Mark, over to you. Thanks so much, Tom. Thanks for having me. Um, I know there are a lot of pundits on this tour, citizen science pundits and all kinds of pundits. Um, uh, I'm going to give you a a uh, whirlwind tour of NASA citizen science. Uh, and then I'm looking forward to, to chatting with you after about it. Uh, so I'm going to start with a little history. Um, it, the history of NASA citizen science is very short. Um, we, of course, have been uh, excited about connecting with the public since uh, since the beginnings of NASA and, and experiment with, with all sorts of different ways of involving the pub public. Uh, like these projects where uh, folks started flying tomato seeds in space and then sending them out to students everywhere. And, and you, as a student, you may or may not receive a, a seed that flew in space, but uh, you had to try to grow it and, and see if it worked. Um, then things really kind of changed a lot when uh, we launched a mission called Stardust in 1999, uh, which aimed to collect particles from comets and it visited uh, Comet Vild 2 and it was carrying the stuff called aerogel, which is very lightweight, and it's great for trapping particles. So the goal was to capture some particles from the comet and bring them home and check them out. And it did that very well, very, very well. Uh, in fact, it generated uh, one, about, captured about 1 million grains uh, and, and generated about 28 million micrographs. So um, the grains are are those little specks at the end of the little trails on the right side of my screen where they've where they've plowed into the aerogel. And uh, to spot them, you, you had to go in with a microscope and change the focal depth and um, scan this, this uh, aerogel at high resolution to try to find the grains. So um, a million grains. Now the prediction is that uh, up to maybe about 45 of these could be not from the comet, but from beyond the solar system. So real interstellar grains. And wouldn't it be amazing if we could find those 45? A classic needle in the haystack problem. Uh, the problem uh, appeared on the desk of Andrew Westfall, who said, hmm, so I've got to sign something rare. Let's look at how they do it in neutrino physics. So the neutrino detector guys have to catch these tiny particles that you know they don't interact with anything. They hardly interact with anything. So the way they do it is they build a lot, a lot of detectors just to catch a few particles. So like the Super Cameo Conda instrument buried under, under a mountain in Japan has 13,000 photomultiplier tubes just to catch a few particles. So they just over and over, search over and over and over again. Over again. So he said, let's invite uh, members of the public to help me search. And if I get enough members of the public, it'll be like having those 13,000 photomultiplier tubes. Maybe somebody will find something <laughs> uh, because we don't have any samples of interstellar matter at all. So even if I find one, that would be magic. So he started this project called Stardust at Home, and he uploaded micrographs in these little movies, focus movies. Uh, onto the site and asked people to look for tracks. In particular, he wanted people to find the tracks that are going the wrong way because he knew from the direction of the track uh, whether it was going to come for the comet that the, the spacecraft was chasing or whether it was uh, flying in from left field, so to speak. Uh, and the volunteer dusters, call themselves dusters, um, found indeed eight interstellar grains, which are currently the only examples that we have of material from beyond the solar system. There was an entire issue of meteoritics and planetary science devoted to analysis of these grains. So that in 20, 2006 uh, really kicked off 
um, NASA Citizen Science. Uh, this was the inspiration for the uh, Galaxy Zoo project, which then flourished at the Zooniverse. Um, today we have 29 projects that are open to the public. They're all there at science.nasa.gov slash citizen science. Uh, 18 of those are labeled by this little gingerbread man image. Um, it's supposed to be a hug, meaning that anyone anywhere can participate. All you need is a laptop or cell phone. So come try them. Uh, feel free to ignore the rest of my talk. If you want to spend the rest of the time doing our projects, A-OK -okay with me. Our citizen science projects save lives. So we have a project called Landslide Reporter that's building an open database of landslides. You hear of a landslide, you just hop on your cell phone and you report it. Um, ditto for Globe Mosquito Habitat Mapper. The goal here is to find places, breeding sites for uh, mosquitoes. So open, uh, you know, little pockets of, of standing water where they lay their eggs. And you can take pictures of the larvae, try to figure out what kind of mosquito it is and upload it figure out how Zika virus is spreading across South America. We have a whole slew of climate-related citizen science projects that are trying to understand climate change. And this kind of project really benefits from the fact that citizen scientists can, can be and are everywhere. So uh, we can get data. We don't have to hire uh, 10,000 NASA civil servants to go combing around uh, looking in kelp beds and climbing into lakes and uh, clawing around on, on, on ice flows. We have, we're lucky to benefit from the, the uh, contributions of folks like Lauren Farmer, who became a NASA citizen scientist. She was working as a photographer on a uh, nuclear submarine, nuclear powered uh, Russian icebreaker. And then she started working on Fjord Phyto, collecting uh, samples of uh, phytoplankton for us. So it used to be that I would tell stories like, oh, NASA citizen scientists are actually doing real science, as though we should be excited about that. The thing that I get to tell people now is that NASA citizen science projects have come to dominate multiple scientific fields. So NASA citizen scientists have discovered most of the known comets. There's no qualifier on that. It's just most of the known comets. All of the known samples of interstellar material, half of the ultra cool brown dwarfs, a third of Kepler's long period extrasolar planet. We've also discovered, and yes, I'm going to read this, um, the TP10 special signature for lightning at 15 to 30 megahertz, the star forming regions called yellow balls, a rare six planet transiting system, the first extreme t t uh, sub dwarfs, Zika virus improving in cemetery variations, the oldest white dwarf debris, the dipper star phenomenon, the Peter Pan disk phenomenon, exocomets and Kepler data, the minor family of comets, the transiting planet in the quadruple star system, 400,000 Martian seasonal plants, 283 emperor penguin nests, 9,120. Uh, candidate near Earth asteroids, 8,900 mosquito breeding grounds, and dumped out the water so they got rid of the mosquito seven meteorites and one new kind of aurora named Steve. And there is a coin, a Canadian coin with a picture of Steve on it, discovered by uh, Aurora sources and scientists. Um, and we were very excited to see that Astronomy Magazine listed NASA citizen science among its top 10 space stories last year. NASA citizen science projects, of course, are, and this is a quote from our policy, are science projects that rely on volunteers. We reach through our various partners, about 2 million volunteers from all 50 states and more than 167 countries. Here are pictures of them, and I've labeled them according to their professions um, to show off the fact that our citizen scientists come with a variety of talents uh, and they're, they're just super smart. Um, so if I just take the statistics about what fraction of human beings have advanced degrees and I multiply that by the number of people we reach, we have more than 140,000 citizen scientists with advanced degrees. Our survey suggested that our citizen scientists are actually more educated than average, but never mind that. Let's just go with the average. Uh, just that alone is, a, is one sixth of the entire US science and engineering workforce. Uh, no wonder that NASA citizen scientists, 410 of them, uh, 
made substantial enough contributions that they became named co-authors on refereed published scientific papers. So I started uh, tracking uh, publications of our citizen science projects, and I realized that um, that was an impossible task. All I could manage to do was the ones that were actually had citizen science co-authors. That was already enough because uh, we have so many of them. Uh, so uh, this is one reason that I laugh when people say, well, can't we do all of the citizen science uh, by machine learning as machine learning gets better and better? Well, surely we'll be able to replace all these, these feeble humans um, with their robot overlords, right? So uh, of course, um, machines lack, lack curiosity, but here's the real reason why it's no contest. We write our own machine learning codes. Like we have citizen scientists who are machine learning engineers. We have machining, we have citizen scientists who are computer security researchers. And there you can see in real time, uh, one of Dan's um, TensorFlow codes busy chugging its way through NASA data. Uh, we've been learning more about the motivations of our top citizen scientists. So we're, we try to stay in touch with, with um, the folks who have been publishing papers, learn more about them. And we have accumulated a little bit of data on uh, why they've blessed us with their contributions. And um, we found out their top motivations are that they do this to fulfill a childhood dream. So a lot of them were inspired at childhood. And then uh, we get the chance to work with them now later in their life. Um, uh, they want to make real contributions to science. And a big one was uh, relationships that they form with scientists and other volunteers. Major motivator is uh, the chance to hang out with like-minded people. And that's a big reason that many of our citizen science project teams have started having real-time meetings directly with their volunteers. Um, for some folks, uh, you know, for folks from the... the uh, you know, the, the, the earth science world, this may seem like an obvious thing because you're always doing these backyard, uh, you know, bird uh, censuses and, and, and nature walks and things like that. But um, for a lot of more uh, online projects, uh, this took a bit of a cultural shift to achieve this, but projects are having video cons with their scientists, regular phone calls. And these real-time interactions really make the difference. They, they really, um, they change people's lives. Uh, they change lives of the citizen scientists. They change lives of the scientists. It is incredibly motivating when you invite a, a colleague onto one of the calls and they meet the citizen scientists, um, they are just blown away. And um, we've seen projects that kind of accumulate not only citizen scientists, but also professional scientists and kind of swelled to take over the whole entire field. I went to a meeting at the American Astronomical Society where the session, most of the presenters in the session, it was not designed this way, but most of the presenters in the session end up being all members of a certain citizen science project. So um, this is really what moves the needle in terms of, 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 of changing lives, is these real-time interactions. Um, and I hear more and more great stories about this every day, like Mikhail Allen, who changed her major from business to physics after getting involved uh, in a Backyard World's Planet Nine project and going to the attending the weekly meetings. Here's another cool one. Uh, I just met Emily Mason, who started working out, who started working on Planet Hunters. She discovered it during uh, her college breaks. And um, she was a humanities major and she changed her mind. She said, hey, I think I'll apply to an internship. And she got an internship. And then a few years later, she got uh, a grad school position. A few years later, she got, uh, she got a job working for NASA. And then recently, she just won funding from our seed funding program uh, to start her own NASA-funded citizen science project, which is about recurring active areas on the sun. So what's next? Um, well, you've probably heard, probably seen the gorgeous pictures from the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, so uh, 
a few citizen scientists are, are already involved in the space telescope activities. We have uh, Austin Rothermich and Dan Castleden, who um, helped write a winning cycle one James Webb proposal. And the telescope's already taking data for them on objects that they proposed. We have three more citizen scientists who discovered brown dwarfs that will soon be observed by James Webb. And we have upcoming citizen science projects that are monitoring exoplanet targets. So, you know, one of the big goals of James Webb is to take spectra, transit spectra of, of exoplanets as they pass in front of their stars. And, um, but one of the challenges is that, you know, if you discovered the planet five years ago, and that's when you timed, that's when you found out the timing of the transit, well, the planet's orbit tends to evolve. And especially if you don't know precisely when the transit was, whatever error you had, uh, you know, propagated into the future gets bigger and bigger. So uh, folks need to monitor those planets and keep that timing up to date. And uh, that's what Exoplanet Watch is going to do. Stay tuned. It's supposed to launch uh, this winter. And you may have come across, if you watch any of those awesome new images from James Webb, I bet you saw these uh, from Judy Schmidt, who started out as a star dust at home duster and disc detective detective <laughs> um and you know just stayed involved with science uh she's a stay-at-home mom and uh she's also a um now world famous uh for her images which she finds herself in the archives uh and um processors herself she uh does image subtraction um on the images and uh, great story. Um, they're not just pretty. Um, she One of the images that she found, uh, she was a galaxy, an active galactic nucleus, and she saw these rays coming out of it, and she did some image subtraction on them to, 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 uh, to try to get to the heart of what was going on, uh, and posted the result on Twitter, and some professional astronomers uh, saw what she posted and said, hey, we should talk, and her discovery of uh, crepuscular rays from an AGN turned into a paper in the Astronomical Journal. I wish we could send NASA funding to other countries. We can't. But if you have colleagues in the United States, please team up and propose to our seed funding program. Um, the next due date is January 24th. Uh, we try to make this um, we try to make it super easy for people to propose. Uh, the, so the proposals are, are limited to six pages. Uh, and it's just for one year funding to get a project uh, through the, over the hump, you know, as it's, as it's being launched, meaning it's being first introduced to the public. And I just want to end on a couple of these quotes that blew me away for some of our citizen scientists. I'll just let you read these. Melina Thibno, by the way, uh, discovered this object that's behind me. So um, she was looking through, she was using Backyard Worlds Planet Nine, and one of the goals of that project is to find brown dwarfs. And she said, wait, you could also use it to find unusual white dwarfs. So she just pivoted in a totally different direction and started, you know, turning in these lists of white dwarf with uh, candidate uh, dust disks around them. And she found the oldest known example. So it's an analog of the sun, uh, but 9 billion years old instead of 5 billion years old. So it's the peak into the distant future of our solar system, the most distant future. Uh, sets the record for the most distant future. Please drop me a line. Thanks, everybody. So yes, yeah, so each project I would say aims to be accessible to this broad a swath of the, of the public as they possibly can. And of course, as you mentioned, that can be hard, right? Uh, so you um, uh, you know you 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 put out there as much training as you possibly can, and we've gotten better at advising our projects and how to do that. Um, uh, one great approach 
is um, universal design for learning. Uh, so um, just this philosophy where you teach the same idea in multiple different ways using multiple different media, right? And that helps you kind of reach, um, it reaches different kinds of learners and it also reinforces the skills of, of people who are, you know, who can receive all those different channels, right? Uh, uh, so that's one approach. And it's an approach that's been used very successfully by our big partner, Zooniverse, right? So if you look at a Zooniverse project, they have, to help you learn, uh, right? They have a tutorial, they have an information page, they have a field guide, right? And that's all before you, you. Um, that's all sort of the required baseline stuff. And then projects will go way beyond that. They'll also make videos. We often have citizen science scientists who will make their own training videos uh, to help other citizen scientists get along. Uh, so, uh, that's one one approach. Um, we also have projects that are explicitly connected with, you know, NASA has has lots of other teams that are expert at both working with learners of all ages. This is a science activation program. There's a whole comms uh, team. So um, we often team up a citizen science project with a um with a group that's working with uh educators informal educators uh with various different other communities of learners and that have the expertise for how to uh connect those different groups together that's another approach that we take Right, so the um, demographics we get are precious few. Um, there's a big challenge in collecting demographics. I, I'm guessing you encountered this, both as a government agency, you know, we're not supposed to just survey everybody and say, you know, what's your income, right? You can't do that. Um, so we know something about uh, citizen scientists that we featured on our website because we interview them. Uh, and that's where the motivation side is quoting. We also know something from our various partners uh, like Zooniverse uh, does indeed survey its participants. Not all of its participants participate in the survey, right? Uh, but you know they feed us some data, uh, and um, so we gather little bits and pieces like that. So for our um, the citizen scientists that we've interviewed, right? So these are ones that have published our you know stars, our rock stars. Um, we know that they are mostly men. We also know that they're mostly international. Um, interesting feature. Um, in terms of what data I've gotten back from Zooniverse on participants, um, Zooniverse is, because that's our biggest population. So about half of our projects are on Zooniverse. So um, Zooniverse as a whole is uh, roughly equal uh, male, female. Um, it's, however, project by project, there are big gender differences. Uh, and I'm trying to wrap my head around those. <laughs> there are many people, right? So one thing we know is that the astronomy projects tend to skew heavily male. Uh, and that earth science projects tend to skew more female. If you can solve that mystery for me, please send me a note. <laughs> so, Anecdotally, I have a suspicion that we are reaching a lot of people who are, um, they are either retired or they are, they have, they are um, either sick or they have a disability. I, I think that that, those demographics are better represented than most among our citizen scientists. I see that among our um, public citizen scientists and Zooniverse also, their most recent survey suggests that there's a big bump in uh, the 65 and over age group. So maybe that we're, we're serving that group, especially well.
So um, we do have this definition that the citizen science projects must rely on volunteers, which defined as people who aren't paid. Um, but that doesn't mean they can't also pay some people, right? Um, there are certainly, I've he heard about citizen science projects that are paying, you know, making micro payments to volunteers. Um, but none of the projects on my list have that as a major part of their strategy. Oh yeah, challenges. So the biggest one is the training. I call it the training challenge. It's how do you take a small number of subject matter experts, if you like, and connect them with a large number of, of volunteers, right? So we have all those projects that are, this growing list of projects that's learning the importance of um, real-time interactions, right? How do I get real-time interactions going on with the 2 million plus casual participants. Uh, I've got a, a gap there that we've got to close. So that's that's next on my horizon as 